Flying Aircraft Carrier, America's formidable new weapon will soon become a reality. The embodiment of U.S. naval power is, of course, its 10 aircraft carrier strike groups, each with one nuclear-powered aircraft carrier, a 30-knot floating airfield of at least 165 million pounds. But America is not only the greatest naval power, but it's also the greatest aviation power. And what does its aviation power represent? The F-22 and F-35 stealth fighters, as well as the Northrop Grumman B-2 Spirit, a heavy, low-observable strategic bomber? Absolutely. But the U.S. may soon have flying aircraft carriers as well. Now, we'll tell you about this interesting project of the U.S. Army, which can change a lot in the wars of the future, which in the light of today's events seems inevitable. Engineers had the idea of flying airfields, that is, flying machines capable of carrying other aircraft on them, before the First World War, that is, more than a century ago. Why did the need for them arise? It's all about the limited range of fighters on the one hand and the vulnerability of bombers to fighters on the other. In other words, more than a century ago, the bombers of the time had a large enough range to destroy enemy targets in their deep rear, but fighters did not fly that far and could not accompany the bombers. Therefore, they became easy targets for enemy planes. But if fighters could be taken with them and released into the sky at the right moment, then the effectiveness of bombing could be increased many times over. The first flying airfields were created by the Germans. True, they were not airplanes, but airships, the famous Zeppelins. In January 1918, an experiment was conducted. An Albatross D-3 fighter jet was attached to the lower part of the L-35 airship. This design was successfully tested, but the war was coming to an end by that time and nothing could save Germany, so air carriers did not have the time to show themselves in all their glory. In the 1930s, the USA became a leader in the development of aircraft carrying airships. They created the two largest aircraft carriers in history, USS Akron and USS Macon. They were very large aircraft. The Akron, for example, was almost 240 meters long and had a crew of 89. Each such airship could carry up to five small aircraft that could conduct reconnaissance or defend the aircraft. In 1932, the N2Y trainer and the F9C Sparrowhawk fighter, having left the airship, were able to dock back to it using a special device, but in the airship's internal hangars. So Akron and Macon were real flying military bases. They were incredibly technically complex machines. The fate of the Akron and Macon airships was tragic both crashed. The cause of the disasters was the lack of structural strength. The military realized that this was a dead end, a flying airfield must also be an airplane. The first who managed to create and use aircraft carriers in real combat conditions was the USSR. There in the 1930s, the Link project was developed. It included a heavy bomber, TB-3, and two fighters, I-16, which were suspended under its wing. Each of the fighters could carry two bombs weighing 250 kilograms. Quite a serious argument by those standards. The first successful operation with the Zven managed to carry out as early as 1941. At that time, air carriers bombed oil storage in Romanian Castanta. The I-16s disconnected from the mother plane at a distance of 40 kilometers from the target, and after hitting the ground, returned on their own to the Odessa airfield. But to return to the carrier plane was out of the question. The fact is that large air disturbances are created around it in flight, so any such landing by hand without modern computers and sensors turned into a deadly attraction, which would surely end in an aircraft crash in the end. Interest in aircraft carriers flared up with the advent of nuclear weapons and the outbreak of the Cold War. It's important to remember that up until the development of advanced intercontinental ballistic missiles, the primary means of delivering an atomic charge into enemy territory was the strategic bomber. At the beginning of the Cold War, the Americans consolidated their leadership in this area by building the giant Convair B-36. For self-defense, the plane had as many as 16 20 mm cannons. But that, in the military's opinion, was not enough. So they decided to give the B-36 a McDonnell XF-85 Goblin fighter, which was housed inside and would protect the bomber from attacks by Stalin's Falcons if necessary. The XF-85 was inside the carrier plane and released outside with a special mooring device. The Goblin itself was a miniature jet fighter armed with four 12.7 caliber machine guns. 
It had a good speed of up to 1,043 kilometers an hour, but in terms of total performance, it was far inferior to the best fighters of the United States and the Soviet Union. This was one of the reasons the X-85 concept was abandoned. Only two prototypes of the Goblin were built. Another similar idea was the TomTom. -Tom. This project called for attaching F-84 fighters to the wingtips of the B-29 and B-36 bombers. The latter was a more formidable machine than the Goblin, but this air carrier project too faded into oblivion. In the way of realization was the question of safety. Powerful swirls coming off the wingtips of the bomber caused the strongest rolls of fighters, so it was not quite clear to US fighter pilots who was more dangerous to them the enemy, or the bomber they were supposed to protect. With the advent of intercontinental missiles as well as the creation of safe air refueling system, the concept of flying aircraft carriers seemed to be buried forever. But unmanned aerial vehicles intervened. Their rapid development had already changed many combat techniques in many ways. The idea emerged to create an aviation system, a carrier plane plus a swarm of drones capable of performing reconnaissance and attack functions. Imagine the picture. A huge aircraft outside the enemy's air defense zone releases dozens of small UAVs which fly several hundred kilometers, performing their assigned tasks in enemy territory, and then return to their flying airfield. Of course, each such UAV is inferior in performance to the F-35 or F-22, but they would cost thousands of times less, and there would be dozens of them in the right place at the same time. Such a system, in terms of tactics, should occupy an intermediate position between cruise missiles and airplanes. The former is capable of attacking targets independently, but they're quite expensive. Aircraft strikes can be cheaper, but the aircraft have to enter the enemy's air defense zone. The use of such UAVs will make it possible to perform reconnaissance or combat missions with the required efficiency, but without risks for manned aircraft. As part of this concept, the Gremlins program was adopted under the auspices of the Office of Advanced Research Projects of the U.S. Department of Defense, abbreviated DARPA. Gremlins are mythical creatures from English military folklore. The main goal of the program is to get a functional system to launch and return low-cost reusable UAVs aboard an airborne mothership as quickly as possible. Gremlins must launch from various types of mothership bombers, transport, aircraft, fighters, and carrier UAVs while they're still out of enemy air defense range. First of all, the feasibility of multiple drone use is considered in terms of reducing overhead costs. Figures of 10 to 30 applications after which the economic payback of such systems is achieved are mentioned. The first carrier aircraft was a converted Lockheed C-130 Hercules. It'll carry several Dynetics X-61A UAVs. Developed under the Gremlins program, the X-61 is a relatively small drone, 4.2 meters long, with a wingspan of 3.5 meters. The payload mass is about 65 kilograms. The UAV has a single Williams F-107 turbofan engine, which can reach speeds of Mach 0.6. The X-61 is expected to carry a variety of payloads, including sensors, electronic warfare systems, and weapons. In November 2019, the X-61, placed under the Hercules wing, successfully detached from it and performed an independent flight that lasted 1 hour and 41 minutes. The experiment did not involve returning the vehicle to the plane. Therefore, X-61 had to land by parachute. However, due to a malfunction, the parachute did not open and the UAV crashed. In 2020, there were several unsuccessful experiments involving the return of the X-61 to the carrier aircraft. In the end, all of the vehicles returned to Earth using their parachutes. But finally, on November 6, 2021, Hercules used an extendable mechanical arm to catch the X-61 and drag it into its cargo bay. The experiment is the final step for the final flight test. It should demonstrate the ability to receive four X-61As in less than 30 minutes. It's also become known that DARPA is studying the possibility that the personnel of the carrier aircraft deploying the drones will load new payloads on them. So in one flight of the carrier plane, the Gremlin could perform multiple missions. The current DARPA project is seen as experimental and is designed to test basic technical solutions in the UAV swarming field. In the future, based on the experience gained, a new similar system may be developed, initially suitable for use in the Air Force. 
The Pentagon plans to get already full-time flying aircraft carriers by 2030. So we can very likely assume that the U.S. will not only be the country with the most powerful fleet of aircraft carriers at sea, but also with the most powerful fleet of aircraft carriers in the air. Like this video and subscribe to our channel, and you won't miss new interesting videos about exciting new weapons projects.